Stoke. Electrify. Transplant those afterburners. Welcome back Autobots, Decepticons, and everything in between to another Transformers Theory. Today's is going to be covering Jolt's origin and timeline in the Bayverse. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Now Jolt is by far the most interesting yet simultaneously most forgettable character in the entire Bayverse. With him randomly appearing with the Autobot cast a third into the movie with no introduction whatsoever. His only purpose in the film was to link up Optimus and Jetfire together, and after the job was done, he was never seen again. Up until Transformers The Last Night, where we got to see his severed head. But before we construct Jolt's origin and timeline, a quick word from our sponsor, World of Warships. Now, World of Warships is a free-to-play team-based sea battle strategy game available for PC, with more than 400 warships for you to choose from. There are more than 44 million players and five different warship classes, destroyers, battleships, cruisers, aircraft carriers, and submarines. After the success of the first collaboration, Transformers are back in World of Warships, and they brought reinforcements. Hot Rod and Grimlock have joined the battle with fellow Autobots Optimus Prime and Bumblebee on the high seas of World of Warships. But Megatron and Rumble have reinforcements of their own with Decepticon, Soundwave, and Starscream entering the fray. This is a limited time event ending on October 21st. So act quickly to claim your free ships and Transformer Commanders. During this event, you can unlock special Transformer Commanders for your ships. The event also has special camos and Transformer-themed ship skins to transform your ship into the ultimate war machine. To start your voyage, click on the first link in the description below. And during registration, you can use the promo code AUTOBOTS2021 or DECEPTICONS2021 to get a boatload of rewards. AUTOBOTS2021 gives you 1 million credits, Grimlock as your Autobot commander, a tier 5 French premium destroyer, Sirocco, and 20 Autobot ship camos. While Decepticons 2021 gives you 1 million credits, Soundwave as your Decepticon commander, a tier 5 Italian premium cruiser Genova, and 20 Decepticon ship camos. And note that these codes are only for new players, and players who were inactive for more than 30 days. So what are you waiting for? Download World of Warships today. Now as for why Joel's representation in the movie was so messy was because he was quite literally a last minute addition to the film. You see, during the four month rush to get a script done after the writer's guild strike, the writers had to convince Bay that Joel would feel like a true member of the main Autobot roster. Ultimately, this wasn't what you would call a success. Jolt only appeared in robot mode for three scenes of the movie, with him having no speaking lines whatsoever. He even abruptly disappears from the Autobot vehicle mode group shot where he appears for the first time. Furthermore, there is an early concept scene of the Optimus and Jetfire combination, and Jolt isn't even present with Ratchet being the one to combine the two instead of our boy Jolt. And if you think that Jolt's mismanagement stops here, you are terribly mistaken. Since during the production of Revenge of the Fallen, Dakara Tomy was informed that Jolt had been dropped from the movie, so product development on him was halted. However, when they saw a photo of Jolt on the set of Revenge of the Fallen, they realized that contrary to what they had been told, he was still in the movie and they went back to work on his toys. Additionally, none of Jolt's toy and comic book appearances were accurate to his CGI model until the Studio Series figure. Closer inspection of his head reveals that the final design was far less spiky than the concept art Hasbro used for the toys and comics. As a consequence of being so disposable to the plot of Revenge of the Fallen, Jolt did not appear in any tie-in comics, books, or video games until seven months after the film had come out. And to keep up the trend of inconsistencies, the studio series backdrop for Joel is an image of the Battle of Chicago from Transformers Dark of the Moon, a movie which he did not even appear in. The only explanation I have for this mishap is that Jolt was the cameraman for TF3. But on a more serious note, this goes to show that Jolt went through production hell. And it's a miracle that we even got him in Revenge of the Fallen despite his short role in the film. So in an honor to make something go right for Jolt, I'll be constructing a timeline of events for him in the Bayverse. Starting off with his origin, so we can finally understand how he came to Earth and how his head ended up in Cade's junkyard. 
As for the reason why we're starting off with Jolt's origin, that's because he's quite literally one of the most fascinating bots in the Bayverse. Since he's the only Cybertronian who was able to use electricity as a weapon, with him being able to generate an electromagnetic field that can levitate transforming him, allowing him to be able to disassemble and reassemble it into anything at will. A prime example of this was when he turned Jetfire's body into a jetpack for Optimus. And, if you think about it, this makes Jolt the most overpowered character in all of Bayformers, since in theory he could use his whips to disassemble his opponents, and turn their body parts into armor and weapons for himself or his comrades on the battlefield. We know that Jolt has used his electromagnetic powers before since Ratchet instructs him to transfer Jetfire's afterburners, so based upon that he must have used his power in the past. This also leads me to believe that Jolt is a nurse since Ratchet is the one instructing him on what parts to transfer. And this procedure has a name, that being electrification, since Ratchet tells Jolt to electrify. Jolt, electrify! And this leads me into my next point. Is Jolt the only Transformer with this ability? And to that I would say yes. Since if all Transformers had electrification, then this ability would have definitely been used in the first movie. For example, when Brawl died, Bumblebee could have taken his parts to rebuild his legs. But as we know, that never happened and this ability never showed up in the sequels. Which leads me to believe that electrification is solely exclusive to Jolt. A detail in Revenge of the Fallen that I find fascinating is that Jetfire tells Prime to take his parts. But how in the world would Jetfire know that the Autobots would be able to do this since the Star Harvester was already activated and Ratchet clearly did not have the tools to do it? Well, that's because Jetfire knew Jolt was there. You see, Jetfire and Jolt are the only two Cybertronians in the Bayverse that have godlike abilities. Jetfire, as we know, was created by the Fallen, who is one of the original Seven Primes and had the ability of teleportation. And as we know, Jetfire has that ability as well, which we can infer was given to him by the Fallen. So what does this have to do with Jolt? Well, I think he is a creation of one of the Seven Primes. As we know, the Fallen and his army were beating the other Primes in the war for the Matrix. With their army dwindling, the Primes had to do something or face extinction. I think one of them came up with the concept of recycling their Fallen soldiers. In theory, this concept would allow their troops to use the bodies of the deceased as a means to upgrade themselves so they would have a better chance of defeating the Fallen's army. Now granted, we do not know what godlike ability abilities the other Primes had. We do know they have abilities in the first place since the Fallen can teleport. So it may not be that big of a stretch to say that one of the Primes had the ability of electricity, and retooled this concept with the element of electrification. So with that in mind, the Prime with the power of electricity created the Laser Rods, a group of Transformers that could use electricity as a weapon and be able to generate an electromagnetic field that could manipulate Transformium, allowing them to be able to disassemble and reassemble it into anything at will, letting them turn the bodies of the deceased into armor and weapons for themselves and their comrades. This is how Jetfire knew Jolt, since they were both creations of a higher power pinned against each other. As we know, the Fallen's army eventually won the war sometime after the Primes hit the Matrix. So it's highly likely that Jetfire saw many laser rods in action, and knowing the power they possessed, targeted them so the war could come to a swift end. This is why we don't see any other laser rods in the film since they all likely died out besides Jolt. I speculate once the war was lost, Jolt made a spacecraft from the parts of the Fallen Soldiers and made his way to Cybertron, where his unique skill set would aid the Autobots tremendously. But now with Jolt's origin out of the way, let's move on to Jolt's movie timeline, which has three key points to cover. How did he get to Earth and meet up with the other Autobots? What happened to him after Revenge of the Fallen? And how did his head end up in the junkyard? Now, the first time that we see Jolt in Revenge of the Fallen is at the 49 minute mark, and we see him rolling out with the other Autobots. Now, a fair point you can make on why he arrived late was because he was on a mission somewhere else. And though this seems plausible, this isn't the case, since Nest doesn't even have Joel in their system. You see, the Autobots during this shot sent out a distress message about the approaching Decepticon contacts coming their way. In this shot, we see five markers representing the cons, those cons being the five that jumped out of the Bayos Freightliner. We also see six markers representing the Autobots, 
And this is the problem at hand since there are seven Autobots with the addition of Jolt. And with his marker clearly missing from the Autobot SOS screen proves that Nest did not have Jolt in their system. Now you could say that Nest must have known about Jolt since nobody questioned his existence when he showed up at the Nest base. And though this is a valid point, you have to take into account that Optimus just died. The USS Roosevelt aircraft carrier went down with all hands being lost. The military had assumed Condition Delta, which is the highest level the US has been at since 9-11. President Obama was flown to a secret bunker, and the world was simultaneously attacked by the Decepticons. So with that said, Nest was clearly occupied with more important things to think about. Hence why Nest did not question Jolt's existence when he showed up at the base. We do know that he was later added into the Nest database, since we see him and the other Autobots being transported to Diego Garcia in their own separate netting. So this clearly shows that Jolt would later be accounted for. So circling back to when Jolt came to Earth, Logically, he must have landed near the Autobots when they were out on patrol. This would explain why Nesta didn't have him in their system. Once he landed, he would have scanned his Chevy Vault alternate mode and made his way to the other Autobots. The only issue with this is that Jolt is a 2011 Chevy Vault. To be more specific, the Vault hit retail in December 2010, but the model was classified as a 2011. So clearly, this vehicle shouldn't exist since the movie is set in 2009. Now granted, the only explanation for this is that in the Bayformers universe, the Volt hit retail sometime before the events of Revenge of the Fallen, which would allow Jolt to be able to take that form. And granted, many cars in the Transformers movies shouldn't even exist such as the Chevy Stingray tracks and beat concepts, so this explanation may not be that big of a stretch. Another inconsistency I will point out is that Jolt should have been present with the other Autobots during the forest battle, since earlier he was with them when they were rolling out. As for where he went during this time is unclear, but we do know that he regroups with the Autobots later since he shows up at the Nest base. And with that squared off, that covers how Jolt got to Earth. But now let's move on to what happened to him after the events of Revenge of the Fallen. And well, we do know that Jolt's head ends up in the junkyard, but how it got severed and how he died are still a mystery. But we do know this. On August 2nd, 2010, Nelson Lauren, the webmaster of Michael Bay's official website, declared on the message boards of TFW2005 that there would be no Jolt for Dark of the Moon. To support this, Jolt is among the Autobots killed off by Shockwave in IDW's Dark of the Moon prequel, Rising Storm. Now, as you may know, I say that the comics are not canon. And that's due to Age of Extinction and The Last Night retconning many events. But this doesn't mean that the entire comic universe isn't canon, since many events still do line up nicely within the Bayverse. And I think Shockwave killing Jolt is one such event that lines up since in Dark of the Moon, Optimus is enraged at Shockwave, with him purposely making his death as gruesome as possible. And the movie never gives us a clear explanation on why Prime does this. But if you take into account the event of Shockwave massacring the Nest base, it starts to make a whole lot more sense. Hence why I believe the reason why Jolt was missing from Dark of the Moon was due to him being one of Shockwave's many victims. Now from here, this takes us to our last point. How did his head end up in the junkyard? Now granted, it's never confirmed if this severed head is Jolt's. They are similar, but at the same time, very different. So it's up to your own headcanon to decide if this head belongs to Jolt. And for me personally, I don't think it is due to it missing so many parts. But just for fun, let's consider this head to be Jolt's and speculate how it ended up here. And, well, logically, there's only one character that could have gotten that head for Cade, that character being Day Trader. Now, granted, we don't know much about him, but we do know that he is able to get his hands on things that he shouldn't, such as a voice box and Starscream's head. On top of that, there are two more additional heads at the junkyard, those being an Autobot and Decepticon head. Now, granted, it's unclear how Day Trader got Starscream's head, with him only saying that he found it in Buffalo. But since he's able to find these objects, I think it's safe to say that he was the one who brought Joel's head to the junkyard. As for how he got it is anyone's guess. We do know that Nessa was shut down and its assets were handed over to Cemetery Wind. 
who in turn made a deal with KSI to give them Cybertronian remains. This is why we see Megatron and Sentinel Prime's head in KSI's possession. So, it's likely that after Jolt was killed, he was buried just like the Dark of the Moon movie prequel comic shows us. This would mean that the Autobot corpses would eventually fall into the hands of KSI to study, and as we know, they purposely severed Cybertronian heads in order to download their minds. How do you think KSI built those bots in the first place, hmm? They had a whole mess of dead Decepticon heads, and they were downloading their minds! This can explain why Jolt's head was severed in the junkyard, but this doesn't give us any closure to how Daytrader got it. The only thing I think would be reasonable is that after KSI was exposed to be the reason behind all the death and destruction done to Hong Kong, it's entirely possible that they were looted in protest, with some Cybertronian technology and heads being stolen. I think eventually Daytrader got his hands on Jolt's head by bartering it from a human. And we know that Daytrader has bartered before since he gave Jimmy an alien blaster in exchange to get into the junkyard. So with that said, I think it is entirely possible that Daytrader got Jolt's head by bartering, with him eventually giving it to Cade for some unknown reason. And I think this explanation neatly explains how Jolt's head ended up in the junkyard. And just like that, that was Jolt's origin and a timeline. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you have not already, check out the Fixing Transformers playlist for some more awesome theories. But before I go, I want to say thank you to all my Patreons and channel members for supporting the channel. Thanks to you guys, Trans Theories is where it is today, so thank you. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, consider dropping a like rating because it does help the channel a lot. With that said, keep on theorizing.